Hi everybody, welcome to the first video for unit five on right triangles. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you about this theorem called the right triangle altitude theorem. Uh, it kind of combines some things that you already know about. If you think back to when we did similar triangles, remember with writing the fractions um, with the side lengths back in our unit on transformations, as well as there's some Pythagorean theorem stuff in here too. Okay, so we're going to talk about the right triangle altitude theorem in this video, as well as something called geometric mean. And these two things kind of, they go together, hand in hand, right? As always, the slides that I normally would go through in class are on the left side of your screen, and your notes, your follow-along notes, are on the right side of your screen. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. All right, so the first thing we have to know about in order to figure out all of these things about the right triangle altitude theorem is to know what the heck an altitude is, right? So if you think about where you've heard the word altitude before in your life, the thing that I typically think about is like flying in a plane or maybe climbing or hiking, right? Where altitude is just your distance straight up from the earth right? So in a triangle, the altitude is a very similar thing. It's basically the height of the triangle when you have the triangle kind of laying on its, uh, on its side, okay? So in this picture right here, AN, which is this line segment right here, sorry, my mouse is not cooperating with me, okay, that is an altitude, okay? It's drawn always from the vertex, uh, of a triangle to its opposite side, right? So in uh, in this triangle, it's drawn from the big right angle all the way down to the hypotenuse. That's the way most of these pictures are going to look. Okay, and you'll notice that it always intersects the hypotenuse or whatever side that it comes into contact with at a 90 degree angle. So it's a perpendicular line, right? Those two lines are perpendicular. Okay, so over here on the right hand side, I'm going to fill in these notes here. So the altitude is a line segment drawn from the vertex of a triangle to its opposite side. Okay, and it intersects the opposite side at a 90 degree angle. Okay, i.e. perpendicular. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Oh, sorry guys, I've kind of been talking all day and I'm losing my voice here as I make these videos. So the right triangle altitude theorem says if an altitude is drawn from the hypotenuse of a right triangle, right, so from the 90 degree angle down to the hypotenuse, then this really cool thing happens where the other two triangles formed are similar to the original right triangle and to each other, okay? So as you can probably see in the image on, uh, I'm gonna do it on the left-hand side just so that I can draw on it a little bit easier, but there's this larger triangle, right? But then there's also the two smaller triangles, right? this one and this one, right? Um, so you have like a small triangle, a medium triangle, and a large triangle, right? If you take the one in green and kind of rotate it and turn it on its side, it looks a lot like the one that I have marked in blue, just smaller, okay? And if you take the whole big triangle and kind of flip it upwards, Right, it also will make a, a right triangle that's the same shape, right? So that is the right triangle altitude theorem. So what that means is that all of the tools that you have for similar triangles apply here, right? So you can set up fractions or proportions with your corresponding sides, right? Do the cross multiplication butterfly method in order to solve for some missing sides. You also will have a bunch of angles that are congruent. So for example, in this one, in all three of these triangles, there's a 90 degree angle, obviously, right? 
here in the small one, here in the medium one, and then here in the big one. Okay, there's also a smaller acute angle. So here in the small triangle, here in the medium triangle, and here also in the large triangle. Okay, and then there's also a larger acute angle, so a slightly larger angle here in both the, at angle M, in both the small triangle and in the large triangle, right? And then it's right here, this one, right, in the medium-sized triangle, okay? So all of those rules that you know about similarity apply here, right, which is kind of neat. But the extra cool thing about this is that because these are also all right triangles, then we have some other tools, right, um, that we can use, like the Pythagorean theorem, that only work, right, or you're only able to solve for missing sides if you're dealing with a right triangle, okay? So what all of this means is you can use your knowledge of right triangles and similarity to match corresponding sides and to find missing side lengths, okay? So your two main strategies that you'll use to find missing parts, right, missing sides, is either fractions with cross multiplication, or second strategy that you may use is the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, and I'm going to show you what that's going to look like in just a second. Okay, now what you see on the left side of your screen right now is an example of one of these triangles where I took, whoops, hold on, sorry, <laughs> my PowerPoint's messing with me here. So what I did is I took one of these right triangles that has an altitude drawn through the middle and I split it into its three smaller triangles, right? Um, and the reason I did that was so that you could see very easily which sides are supposed to correspond. So if this is something that's a little bit tricky for you at the start when you're doing these kinds of problems, it can definitely help to take the triangle apart and break it apart into its smallest triangle its medium-sized triangle and the large triangle, draw them all the same way, right? Uh, with Typically, I draw them with the right angle in the bottom left corner. Um, then I typically put the smallest angle on the right-hand side, and then the biggest angle would be up here at the top, or the biggest, not the biggest angle, but the other acute angle up here at the top, right? And then I can label side links and things in order to find missing values, right? It helps me see which of these strategies would be most effective for me to use if it's a little bit difficult for you to see that just by looking at the triangle as it is okay so what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually going to make this a little bit smaller on this side and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit over here because we're gonna do this same thing with this triangle here, right? And then we're gonna write our similarity statement, which remember matches the correct uh, vertices together, right? Um, the angles that match up as well as the sides that match up, right? We write them in the correct order, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and draw and this is not gonna be exact, right? Um, I'm doing my best to make them the same shape, but it may not be exact exact when I draw them. That's okay, right? Because the point is that it's more of a like a helpful tool uh, for you to use, okay? So here's my three triangles, okay? And then if I wanna label these, this is my small, oops, actually, let's go back. pen was a little too thick there. So this one obviously is my small, this is my medium triangle, and this is my large triangle. Okay, so in my small triangle, the 90 degree angle is here at point N. The larger acute angle is here at point M, and then the other angle is A, 
right? The smaller acute angle is here at point A. In the medium-sized triangle, the 90-degree angle is also at point N. But this time, the larger acute angle is up here at point A. And the smaller acute angle is here at point E. Right? And then in my large triangle, point A is the 90-degree angle. Right? The larger acute angle is M, and the smaller acute angle is E. <coughs> All right, so now it's much easier for me to see which sides match up. I can see that MN should match up in a fraction with MA and with AN, right? Because they're all in kind of the same location, right? So now I can write my similarity statement, right? So I did the first one as M-A-N. So I went kind of down the hypotenuse and then over to the right angle. So I need to follow the exact same order when I name the other triangles. So I have M-A-N-A-E-N. -A -A okay, and then the last one would be M-E-A. All right. Okay, so now let's kind of switch gears just a little bit and we're going to talk about geometric mean. Okay, and then I'm going to bring it all back together for you here. All right. So give me just a second to kind of reorient my screen, uh, make this stuff bigger on the left hand side. I'll see you in just a second. All right, folks. So here we are. We're going to talk about geometric mean. Okay, now you've probably heard the term mean, I'm sure, before in an, a math class, right? Mean is just average, right? But you are used to calculating average probably by having a set of numbers. Like here's a set of numbers, one, two, four, seven, nine, right? And if you wanted to find the mean or the average of those, you would add all of those numbers up and then divide by the total number of entries that you have, which is like five numbers, right? And then you would get a number, right? So then that type of mean is an addition mean. It's like the middle of the data, but using addition. So it's an addition mean, okay? Geometric mean is a multiplier mean, okay? Um, it's the middle, when you think about numbers, it's the middle multiplication wise, okay? And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. Okay, if I have the numbers two, four, and eight, right? There's a common number that I could multiply times two, times two in each of those sequences, right? So four is the multiplication middle of the numbers two and eight, right? Because I can go to the left and like divide by the same number in order to get to that, like to get to the first number, as I do going forward, right? Or going to the right, right? That you're either multiplying or dividing by the exact same number. So even though on the number line, two and four are much closer together, multiplication wise, they're like the same multiplication distance apart, if that makes sense. Okay. So in these right triangles with these altitudes drawn in, the altitude is the geometric mean of the two parts of the hypotenuse that the altitude kind of slices through. Right. So here in this picture, right, AS is the altitude, right? And notice that it divides the hypotenuse at the bottom into two parts, a shorter part and a longer part, okay? So however big that altitude is, it's the multiplication middle of those two parts of the hypotenuse, the side that's kind of being chopped up, okay? So geometric mean, if I'm filling in my notes on the right hand side. Geometric mean is the multiplication middle rather than an addition middle. Okay, the way that you find 
or calculate geometric mean is you always set up the same fraction. So just like when you're doing an addition mean, you always follow the same process where you add all the numbers and then divide by the total number of numbers that you have, right? Um, with a geometric mean, what you do is you take the first number. Oops, I'm gonna change my colors here, one second. Okay, so you take your smallest of the two numbers, so in this case that would be two, right? Then the larger of the two numbers that you're trying to find the middle for goes in the other fraction but on the bottom, okay? And then the geometric mean which is the actual middle, right? The multiplication middle goes in both of your missing spots. So what this means is that you can use your cross multiplication in order to solve for a missing value, right? And find a missing value, okay? Whether it's this first number, the actual geometric mean, the x value in the middle, or if it's the larger of the two numbers, right? And I do have another example for you that I put up here on the screen. Uh, so six is the geometric mean of four and nine, right? Um, so they set up this fraction, right? So basically the problem would say, what is the geometric mean of four and nine? Well, four is my smaller number, so it goes in the top left corner. 9 is my larger of the two numbers. It goes in the bottom right corner, and then I put the geometric mean, which I don't know, in both of these missing spots. They did cross-multiplication, right, in order to get this out of, like, fraction mode uh, and put it into something that's a little easier to solve. So... Remember, anything times itself is that thing squared. So you get x squared equals 4 times 9. So 4 times 9 is 36, right? So x is the square root of 36, right? Because remember, whenever you have an exponent, a squared, the only way to cancel that out is to take the square root. Right? That's how you cancel those out, okay? So... Now, going back to our actual right triangles, let me clear this off. Going back to our actual right triangles, okay, there are two kind of fractions or formulas that it's a good idea to remember, okay? Um, rather than having to like memorize exactly what parts go where um, in which triangles, it's easier just to remember these two fractions, right? Um, so rather than having to do what we did up at the top, where we split the triangle up and then we wrote fractions with the, the side lengths that they gave us, right? Rather than having to do all that, most geometric mean and right triangle altitude problems can be solved with one of these two formulas, okay? The first one I showed you already, which was short divided by altitude equals altitude over long, right? So, the actual thing that is the geometric mean is the altitude, right? The altitude is the geometric mean because it shows up twice, okay? Another version of this that's a little less common but does show up every once in a while is this second one, which I have labeled as fraction formula number two, okay? So it's hypotenuse, meaning the whole hypotenuse, okay, divided by the leg, so either this side, AE, or this side, AY, equals that same leg divided by the adjacent segment. So what I mean by that is it's the adjacent segment of the hypotenuse. Right? It's the adjacent segment of the hypotenuse attached to the leg. Okay, so I'm going to draw it actually over here on the left-hand side because I have a little bit more space over here. Okay, so say for example, here is 
my right triangle, okay? Uh, and say I was told that this whole thing was, I don't know, let's say 15, right? And then I also told you that this small part here is five, right? And then I wanted to know what this value was, okay? So this, the 15 is the hypotenuse. Okay, it's the length of the whole hypotenuse because my right angle is up here, okay? This x is the leg that they gave us, right? And then the adjacent segment is this five, right? Because this leg is closest to this part, right? Or this segment of the whole hypotenuse, okay? And I'm gonna do a couple examples for you. Uh, I'm gonna do one example actually for you um, here where I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so let's take a look at this example here where I said I gave you some information. Now I gave you some side lengths. Okay, so I told you that AN is 7 and NE is 10. Right, and I labeled them on the diagram. And I'm asking you to find three different values AE, which is right here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that one in blue. Okay, I wanted you to find MN, which is this value right here. We'll do that one in green. And then I also wanted you to find MA, which is this value right here, and I'll do that in black, okay? So with the information I'm given here, remember I told you you had multiple different strategies you could use, right? You could either use Pythagorean theorem or use some of our fractions, one of our two fraction formulas right here, rather than, like I said before, having to split the triangle up. Right, you can use the formulas, it'll make your life a little bit easier. Okay, so I have to decide what strategy should I use. Right, so if I'm looking at this first one, AE, well, if I kind of ignore this smaller triangle over on the left and just look at the triangle ANE, well, that just looks like a right triangle where I'm missing the hypotenuse. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so that's the strategy that I'm going to use. Okay. So let's do that. Remember the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm hoping you remember that from your algebra classes because they, your algebra teachers likely pounded that into your brains. Okay, a in this case is seven. So I have seven squared plus b is 10. So 10 squared equals c squared. And C is what I'm looking for. That's my question mark. Okay, 7 squared is 49. 10 squared is 100. Okay, and then I need to add those together. So I get that C squared is 149. Now that's not exactly the answer that I'm looking for, right? I don't want to know what the question mark squared is. I want to know how long that side actually is. So I have to take the square root of both sides. And when I do that, you may end up with a decimal. That's fine, okay, which I do in this case. I get that C, which is what I'm looking for, is 12.21 if I round. So that would be, I think, the easiest way to figure out what AE is, because right? it's something we're a little more familiar with, okay? Now let's switch over, though, and we're going to look at MN, okay, which is right here. So to me, that looks like I should use fraction formula number one. What I'm looking for is the short segment. That's what I don't know. I have that the altitude is 7, so that goes in both of these places, and the long segment of the hypotenuse is 10, right? Okay, so the strategy that I'm going to use is I'm going to use similar triangles, okay? And I'm going to use fraction formula number 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. 
So remember, it's short over altitude. So question mark over the altitude is 7 equals altitude 7 over long. Okay. So now I have 10 times my question mark because I have to do my cross multiplication, right? Chunk 1. 2. So 10 times my question mark equals 7 times 7, which is 49. I'm going to divide both sides by 10. So I get that the length that I'm looking for is 4.9. Okay, so this length is 4.9. I'm going to go switch back to my blue. I forgot to fill this one in. Okay, so this one was 12.21. This one was 4.9. Okay, so then when we get to the last one, MA, well, there are multiple different strategies I could use. I could use basically any strategy because it's the only value that I have left, right? I could use the Pythagorean theorem with the small, um, with the small triangle. I could use the Pythagorean theorem with the big triangle. I would just have to figure out how long this whole hypotenuse is by adding the two parts together. Um, or I could use uh, one of my similar triangles. Just so that you guys have an example, I'm gonna, I personally am going to use fraction formula number two so that you guys can see an example of what that looks like in action. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So I personally am going to use similar triangles. And I'm going to use fraction formula number two. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up our fractions. So this says hypotenuse divided by leg. So the hypotenuse is this whole thing from M to E. So that's 10 plus 4.9, which is 14.9. Okay, divided by leg. The leg is the one of the legs of the big triangle, right? Which is what I'm looking for here. That's my question mark. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, equals leg again. So my question mark divided by the adjacent segment. So if the leg that I'm looking for is here, the adjacent segment of the hypotenuse is here. It's the 4.9. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do my cross multiplication. Right, and obviously, I'm using question marks here, but you can use variables if you want. Like, you could use a variable, right? So I have my question mark squared, right, equals 14.9 times 4.9, right? So I have to plug that into my calculator real quick, right, and do 14.9 times 4.9, maybe, if my calculator will cooperate with me. Okay, and when I do, I get that my question mark squared is 73.01. And then my last step is I need to take the square root of both sides so I can figure out what that question mark length is. So again, I'm going to plug that straight into my calculator. And when I do, I get that the length that I want is 8.5, I'm going to say 8.5. Five when I round. Okay. And with that, you have solved the entire triangle. Okay. Which is super, super awesome. Right. So, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you use the right triangle altitude theorem. Right. I'm hoping you can kind of see after watching this video that there's a lot of overlap with things that you already know. You just have to know how to set up your fractions and you also have to make sure that you know the correct way to plug numbers into the Pythagorean theorem. All right? And that's it. So the next video will go over these practice problems. There's not very many. I just have a couple more for you. So if you um, are feeling confident with just what I've shown you in this video, I think you can definitely go on and try the practice uh, assignment for, uh, for right triangle altitude, but if you want a little bit more practice and want to see me work some more problems, uh, take a look at the next video. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, y'all.